All right, thank you everybody for um, coming. Um, I really appreciate it and I am excited about this. You probably can tell I've tried to kind of let people know in different ways through my weird newsletter a few weeks ago that most people I think didn't understand was intentional because it looked like it was really weird, because it was. And then even like, I know a number of people have kind of reached out to invite you to let you know that this is something that we're really hoping that as many people as possible can be here to hear. And so I'm really grateful that you're here this morning. Um, being that we're in Chicago, it seems appropriate to kind of start here with a quote by Daniel Burnham, if you're not familiar with him. The, the Great Columbia Expo, you know, that World's Fair that was in Chicago over a century ago was something where he was one of the chief architects. He's also the architect of another, a number of famous buildings in Chicago and in New York. Um, and I, I love this quote. He says, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. And I'm saying that as a preface because hopefully you'll be convinced that this is not a little plan that we are kind of endeavoring on here. But more importantly, what we've already heard is Jesus' words to us. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. And so over the last eight months or so, because uh, there's been a lot of lead up to kind of this meeting, uh, our elders, our deacons, our women shepherding team, our staff, we have been meeting and praying and thinking together, saying if we wanted to say, what does it look like to be fruitful as our church? What is God calling us to? Um, we've used this name, Project 20, which I realize is a little gimmicky, but sometimes it's useful to have a name so that we can be talking about something in shorthand rather than saying that larger goal and just kind of like spelling it out. So this is kind of what we've been focusing on the last eight months. And as elders and deacons, we keep on kind of working on the details and we're trying to think through what does this involve. So let me just kind of give you the initial description of what we feel like God is calling us to pursue. And, and I should say, with a certain degree of humility, right? So we think this is what is honoring to God, always realizing that as we follow in his footsteps, he might shape us. But here's, here's what I want to propose to you, that our goal should be over the next three years to work together to nearly double the size of our church by the end of 2020. Let me just kind of give some idea of what I'm talking about here. So if this is us right now, we are right now about 130, 140 on a given week for attending. You know, over the next few years, we'll probably, you know, lose a few people like the Mosers are going away. Um, and, and, and then for us to kind of move towards the goal where the, the number that we're specifically saying is by the end of 2020 to have 220 regularly attending, that would mean that we now have a whole bunch more people that we don't even yet know. I mean, in, in, in shorthand, Project 20 means fully half of our church is right now outside of these walls. Let me try to give a little bit more of a picture of what I'm talking about here. So community groups, right now we have seven community groups for us to grow in the way that I want, I hope we can. That means we move to 12 community groups. We have 12 discipleship groups, and it means us becoming 18. We have about 50, I know there's all these little guys, I don't know if you can see them, but we've got about 50 people who are actively serving in different ways in our church right now, and we will need more like 80 for us to be able to sustain what I'm speaking about. Or another way of putting this, and this is probably maybe even a more helpful way, is that what we are pursuing is to start functioning like a mid-sized church. See, the, the number when I talk about 220, that number, and I'll tell you, I've always been nervous about speaking about numbers. Probably you know, like I know, there can be churches that just kind of lose sight of anything except how many bums are in seats. That's the joke that people say. And that's obviously not what we are seeking, not just numbers to expand our empire. But... Right now, we are at a place in our church that is commonly spoken of as kind of like the, the, you can call it like the small church barrier, that a small church operates a certain way. As long as it operates in that way, it's always going to run up against a certain ceiling. Because for the church to grow beyond that, it needs to start operating differently. And so when I'm talking about 220, really that's shorthand for saying moving from a functioning small church to a functioning mid-sized church, where the dynamic needs to be different for us to be able to allow that growth to take place. What are some of the things that I mean? Well, that means ownership must be shared to a greater degree. When a church is smaller, things are more centralized. You have a couple of three, three or four, however many key figures that are really driving it. 
But for a church to grow, because there's so much going on, there needs to be multiple people who own it, who lead it, and who share that mission. My role then would increasingly be to just focus on certain people, to focus on the leaders who are investing in things and to focus on the lost, rather than being able to be connected to every single person. And when we move to more of a mid-sized church mentality, it means that we won't know everybody. You know, this is something that a lot of times when churches are struggling and they're, they're transitioning, they feel this. They feel like, I don't feel connected to everybody anymore. I wish we could do more things together. And that's kind of shorthand for saying, we're starting to get too big. But if we want to grow, and I'm going to try to give you a reason why we should want this in a little while, that means we'll start having to transition from rather than seeing all of us connected to each other centrally, to us being connected to each other in other formats, where community groups become our primary relational hubs. So that's part of what we're talking about. We're talking about kind of a growth that's significant. We're talking about a change in our culture. And you're probably going, why in the world would we want to do that? So let me talk about the why. Why I think this is really where we should be going. Growth in size means growth in impact. Um, this is obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I, I, I've said this for years. I am so encouraged by this church. I am so blessed by the love of the community that happens here, the, the transparency when it comes to being people who are broken, and the openness to others to not have everything put together, and the confidence that, that there is about God being gracious. I, I, have, I have grown through being a part of this congregation. And so as I think about just how I have been blessed by all of you, I realize I want more people to experience this. I mean, I think of the different people that we've added in the last few years and each of their stories and how grateful I am for them to both contribute to our congregation, but also hopefully to be shaped and blessed by what God is doing here. And so for us to grow, we're, it's a shorthand for saying we want more people to experience the blessings that we are able to experience. It's, it's how we are going about making disciples. So a growth in size means growth and impact. Every number has a story. And also growth in size means growth in capacity. You know, we can do more as we grow. We can do more as a church together. You know, one of the things that they talk about when you're talking about this, this small church barrier is we're trying to do things that we can barely have the capacity to do. If you are in our children's ministry, you know what I'm talking about. Because right now, everywhere else, you know, we might be a small church, but when it comes to our youngest, we are a mid-sized church already, right? In terms of just the number of kids that we have. And that means we're being stretched for nursery, we're being stretched for children's church, and it's a great stretching. But we, if we, as we grow, we'll have more capacity to be able to do this kind of work. We have more capacity to be able to care for our older kids, to care for our youth. We also have greater ability to serve the community, greater potential for how we can serve Haiti, how we can reach out to Hinsdale. As we grow, we grow in our capacity to serve. But also, and, and here's something I also want to say, if we never actually ever make this goal, even the task of pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone to try to seek this is something we need spiritually. You know, stretching to grow in size pushes us to grow spiritually. In this world, our comfort zone is our spiritual enemy. Hopefully that's what you heard this morning as we were looking at John 15 together. That even if God decides to keep us at this size, if we are on mission mode, if we get in church planting mode as we're trying to in some ways plant a mid-sized church, that in and of itself is good for our souls because it pushes us outside of ourselves, outside of our comfort zones as we seek first the kingdom of God. I mean, in short, I think the reason that we say this is where we need to go is because Jesus tells us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. There is both a command and a promise here, isn't there? The command that we should be about going and making disciples, knowing that Jesus is with us until the very end. So I'm convinced that whether we actually can climb up this mountain or not, we should start hiking. Because this is the kind of work that God calls us to, and it's something that will strengthen and galvanize us as a church. 
So how? how? How is it if we are going to pursue moving from a congregation of about 140 to a congregation of about 220, not just because of numbers, but because that changes the dynamic and enables us to reach more people? How are we going to do this? Well, this probably won't surprise you, but there's no single great idea that's going to get us there. It's not like if I said, all right, next week we're going to hand $5 out to everyone who comes in through this church. That's not going to suddenly, or at least not sustainably, get our church to where we want it to go. There's not going to be one gimmick that suddenly means, boom, we've bought a building and we're 300 people. That's, I don't think most of the time the way actually God works. Rather, first and most obviously, if this is something that we want to do, that we want actually, we've already said, you know, abide in Christ. You can only bear fruit if you abide in me. It begins with prayer. And one of the things that you're probably going to be hearing repeatedly is as we are pursuing this, please, let's pray together for this. And it also means that everyone needs to be pushing in the right direction over a sustained period of time. This is why it was so important to have as many people here together, because I am convinced that the only way that we can do this is if we together agree, yes, this is where God is calling us, and we're all saying, yes, I am in, and I am going to be part of this. There's an illustration. uh, Some of you have read the book Good to Great. Um, There's an illustration where Jim Collins talks about this massive flywheel. Like, I, I had a picture here because I wasn't sure exactly what a flywheel was at first. But, you know, you can imagine, imagine a flywheel the size of this room that's flat, maybe just a couple inches above the ground, and is incredibly heavy, and you've got some pole in the middle that's holding it. And we're talking being tons and tons. Now, I guarantee if we wanted to start moving it, say it's stuck at the beginning, if just Brent and me grab one of these spokes and start pushing, I mean, we'll just, like, start treading and nothing's going to happen to us. Well, um, But if if all of us start doing it, if each of us grabs a spoke, it's still going to be hard. But as we start pushing, it's going to start moving. But it's not just as we start pushing, it's going to start moving. If we keep on pushing, what happens if you push a wheel? Then it starts getting easier and easier and easier. And and to a certain point, you start kind of like almost like having, you know, like not being able to catch up to it if everyone's pushing at the same time. And the illustration's point is that if we keep on persevering together, as long as we have a right understanding of what we need to do, it's not one thing that will suddenly cause us, but it's going to be the slow gathering momentum as we keep on working together. So what is this this kind of flywheel of, of ministry? How is it that if we just work on these things together, we'll be able to start seeing the progress that we're longing for? Well, let me kind of talk you through what I think happens when we're talking about people coming to our church and us growing. I mean, it obviously begins with people entering the body of Christ. You know, someone has maybe heard about our church or has been invited or we've welcomed them in some ways. And as they get plugged in, they experience community, they see things that matter to them, and they get drawn in and become part of our congregation. What happens next? Well, Hopefully they experience the life-changing love of Jesus. That as as we are together, as we're worshiping, as we're communing with each other, we are changed. And more and more we experience Christ as he shapes us more into the people we are created to be. And then as we experience the life-changing love of Jesus, well, you know what we believe should happen next. That we start extending the life-changing love of Jesus. That is, as we get shaped... It sends us outwards. That is inevitably what happens because Jesus himself was sent and he now sends us. And so as we are extending Christ in our workplaces, seeking to to show Christ in the way we work or, or in the way we care for refugees or in the way that we do missions in Haiti or in even just the way that we love our neighbors or even in the way that we are at home, what happens, God willing, is that others then through that begin to encounter the body of Christ. They, they see something attractive. And they take notice. And what happens then, some of them want to come in. And they want to enter. And then they're brought in. And as they're brought in, then they experience Christ's love. And then they are joining in the mission. And then as they are joining in the mission, then others see. And do you see how the wheel starts building on itself? As we keep doing this, if we keep doing this well. Now, one key piece, of course, is that is it's always the work of the Spirit, right? It's the Spirit that draws people in. It's the Spirit that shapes us through Christ Jesus. It's the Spirit that sends us out. But this is really the pattern that we need to be committed to. These things, if you want to speak in terms of what we do, not just in terms of what happens, 
We can speak about hospitality. When people come in, as we show hospitality and welcome, we draw them into the community. Discipleship, as people through worship, discipleship groups, and other different means are being shaped by Christ, then, then they join with us on mission. And as we collectively are together on mission, then people are attracted. And this, this cycle that happens, if we keep at it, and as we continue to pray, and as God blesses us, it builds on itself. So that we see more people coming, and we're just trying to disciple more people, and more people are able to join us for mission, and as more people join us for mission, more people take notice, and more are brought in. And do you see how it keeps building on itself? So what I'm saying is that, that the plan is really not anything too dramatic. It's just each of us pushing beyond our comfort zone so that together, as we pray, we keep getting better at hospitality, discipleship, mission, and attraction. Do you see what I'm talking about? That if, if we, rather than focusing on one massive idea, are focusing on pushing ourselves together out of the comfort zone, we're all putting our hand on that wheel, and we're all pushing together and allowing God to give fruit as we keep working at it. So, so that's kind of the larger picture that I wanted to give. And I wanted then to talk about, so for 2017, 2018, what does that look like in more kind of detail? So we've kind of looked at each of these pieces and a couple more. What does it look like for us to pursue prayer? And, and Wayne Dingler, who can't be here with us this morning, he's the one who's kind of, you know, headed that up. And, and for children, and you'll understand how children relate to this in a moment with Susan Dudek. And, and, and newcomers are attraction. We've got Brent kind of spearheading that. Hospitality, Shelley, and then discipleship and mission, me. And then sending, we'll talk about in a moment. But we're trying to figure out how each of these we can keep growing and pushing so that we can see some of this momentum that we believe God can give us. So what I want to do now for the next few minutes is just kind of talk about each of these and, and what we are seeking to see happen over the coming year as some of the kind of outworkings of this ministry flywheel, for lack of a better way of putting it. Now, if Wayne were here, I would invite him up, but I can't because he's not. So I will kind of stand in for Wayne. And let me tell you first what, what we're going to be doing in terms of how we as a church can be pursuing growth in prayer for the coming year. Um, for each of these little details, I want to just give you one thing that I want you to know and one step I'd like for you to consider taking. So prayer, what is one thing to know this year? We are going to be offering a daily prayer email to help make prayer more a part of our lives. Let me talk about that just a little bit. We, when we are thinking about what, what do we want to be doing in praying, I mean, it's great to have prayer initiatives where we have a study about it, and many of us are doing that, and that's really important. But really, the kind of like the, 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 the brass tacks of it is we want to be praying more as just a part of our daily life. So how can we equip our congregation to be praying? Well, here's what we're planning on doing. One thing you'll know is that if you're part of a discipleship group, that's going to be the focus for the fall, thinking about what God is calling to us, us for prayer. But also, beginning midway through September, for anyone who signs up for this, if you're in a discipleship group or not, during weekdays, you'll get an email in the morning, say about 5 in the morning, and what it will have is it will have a brief passage and a way of praying in the morning, and then another passage relating to what we're going to be preaching on on Sunday in the evening. And a kind of an opportunity, if you want to pray together as a family, here's a way that you can pray as a family. So maybe one day it's, what are things that you've experienced that you can be thankful to God? Just say it around the table and let's spend time in prayer. But the idea is just to have something, a structure, that every day we're getting as an email during the week to help us integrate prayer into more a part of our lives. So the step I'd like to invite you to take is a little while. Shelly is going to be sending an email inviting you to sign up. We're not going to send it to your inbox unless you ask for it. So let me encourage you to sign up for the prayer email list. Because I get really excited about the idea of us together praying for things together. God works as in response to our prayers. All right, so prayer. Let me talk about children. And let me, I know Susan Dudek is here somewhere. There she is. So let me just explain while she's coming up. So with children, how does children fit with this kind of process that I was talking about? Well, our children's ministry actually is fundamental to each of these. With our church, perhaps especially, uh, one of the main ways that people kind of come into our congregation is with children. And if children are able to connect and, and be loved and experience comfort, then parents kind of join with them. And then as children are discipled, 
And then parents and kids together through that are on mission seeking to show love to the world around. That, that causes other parents to take notice. And that's one of the key ways we see this growth take place. So I don't know if we have a mic or I'll, I, I, there's a mic here. Is this mic on? I don't think it is. So that's all right. It is? OK. All right, we'll see if it is. So yeah, that's what I thought. Here's what I'll do. It's going to be awesome. Uh, <laughs> All right. This is not the least bit awkward, by the no, way. No, that's right. No, this is this is good yeah. congregational yeah, we, meeting we, we stuff. Yeah, we had going. this all planned that's out. That's right. We've, we've like had a dry run and everything. So, like, so I said two questions. So first, like, as you are now kind of like overseeing children's ministry, which excites me a ton, and I know it terrifies you. Um, I would love to hear uh, what is one thing that you would like us as a congregation uh, to know for this year. So the one thing I would want you to know, to be thinking about, what? What is he doing? <laughs> that would make it difficult. You know, turning things on or plugging things in, shall we? All right, we'll just do it this way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> is that children's ministry is really vital to a growing church because that's where discipleship and growth begin. And then how about a step to take? Well, funny she should ask. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks from today, on September 10th, in this room, we are going to have a kickoff for the Sunday school programs. The parents, teachers, and students will need to be here. But we would invite all of you to be here to pray for our teachers and students and send them off to their classrooms and to hear information about our plans, our goals, and our hopes for the year, and how you can support us or even be part of us. Thank you. Just to kind of reinforce what she's saying there, <laughs> um, one of the things that we've kind of made as a goal for children's ministry is to help us as a church be collaborative about that. That children's ministry is not just the teachers, it's not just the parents, that we're all in this together. And that's why we're wanting to have all of us, if we can, be there for that September 10 meeting, because we really, really want to prioritize children's ministry. We think that's crucial to who we are as a church. Um, so, so let's then also talk about um, newcomers or attraction. And um, so, you know, this piece of this kind of ministry flywheel, I'd like to, where's Brent? Is he still behind? No, now he's back there and he's just kind of doing a lap. We might have. Yeah, it should work now. Let's find out. <laughs> plug it in. Plug it, plug it in. Plug it in. Check one, two. Okay. All right. Um, tell me a little bit about one thing that people need to know for this year when it comes to newcomers. And, and, and Can I set it up? Yeah, set it up. Okay, Go for let it. me set it up. So uh, many of you know, Susan and I moved to Hensdale a year ago. It's the one-year anniversary for that, and we're just two blocks over. And as we're beginning to meet our neighbors, the ones that have been there for a while on Bowdoin on the 700 block, I was like, yes, have you guys ever heard of Trinity Presbyterian Church, and they said no. They've never, they never, they didn't even know this church existed. And I was like, well, that's that's a problem. We're only two blocks away. Uh, and then, um, uh, so about eighty percent of that block are all new families within the year and a half. And so, as we're a very social block, we get together a lot, and we're running the kids all the time. And now the entire block knows that I'm a pastor at Trinity. But here's the one thing. Like, I forgot to invite them to church. And I was reflecting on this. I'm like, is this out of fear? Or <laughs> probably, I mean, knowing that I'm a fearful person, probably. But I also thought, I'm not in church plant mode anymore. Like, I just started coasting uh -huh. and just kind of assumed, like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, I don't step on their toes or seem forceful or anything like that. And so uh, I think that's probably the majority is like, they're not going to come to church unless you ask them and invite them. And that's the number one reason most people come to church is if with a personal invite so that's my that's kind of my setup for uh -huh. the one thing uh, I want you to know this year um, our goal is to receive 100 newcomers this year is the year of the invite <laughs> so um, we're going to have a couple different things once coming up in just a month or so 
uh, about in inviting uh, people to, especially young moms with kids. And there's going to be some other things that you can invite to. So we're going to be asking you, I'm going to be asking you to invite people. And I really need your help because I would really love to smash this goal this year. I need your help to get 100 newcomers. Uh, it can't be your aunt or uncle. Like, we said that just doesn't count. Unless they live in the area. If they live in the area, But yeah. if they're, like, visiting from Florida or something, that's just not. So I would love... <laughs> I want uh, from this, you know, a year from now that we can all celebrate this together because I need your help to get 100 newcomers. So, so you know, right now on the whiteboard, there is this number that is haunting Brent. And it was like 100 a few weeks ago. Like yeah. now it's what, 97 will be. And like yeah. that's just like a, a tangible. Within the couple weeks, you've had 100 percent growth of newcomers. That's right. And those those just the four newcomers coming. So <laughs> we're doing good. So here's the one step I need you all to take uh, to begin praying about a person or a family you might want to invite. Just someone on your block, a neighbor, it all starts with prayer, as what Jeff was saying. So 100 newcomers this year, and I'm going to ask you to start praying about who you might invite to Trinity. Okay. Thanks. Let's talk about hospitality, and let me invite Shelly Baldridge to come on up. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Shelly has just recently added to our staff. She's the one who's actually getting us organized, and she's doing an awesome job at it. Yes. <laughs> Everyone does better when Shelly is involved. That's right. Um, and one of the things that she's really kind of quarterbacking is our hospitality ministry. Um, and so let me, uh, same questions. Uh, how about you tell us one thing that you would like us to know for this year? So the main thing is that we, is this on still? Oh, I hope so. Anyway, the main thing uh, we're going to be doing is. Can you guys really hear her? Is it? Go ahead, turn it up. Turn it up closer. There we go. Hello. Good. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so we really want to have a very uh, defined and intentional meet, gr meeting and welcoming committee. So one of the main ways that that will be put into place is that we are going to be separating the what has been the greeters at the front door from the community groups and creating a greeting ministry of people who feel gifted in that area. Um, and we're meeting with them on a semi-regular basis to just talk about how are we welcoming visitors? Are we being intentional and consistent with that? Um, so it's not just, um, you know, I mean, Trinity has done a really good job in the past of being a very welcoming congregation, but we want to make sure that we have people on the floor in the uh, hospitality time and also at the front door who are really trained and have been thinking about this and been working with us about how we can be very, very intentional about this. So that's the one thing that you would need to know that um, would be changing. And also something that you can be doing for a step to take is to make greeting uh, visitors a priority on Sunday morning. And I know it's easy to come into church and just talk to people that you know, but if there's ways that we can be meeting those visitors, keeping an eye out for them, and then including them in our conversations and connecting them with other people in their area, um, that would be fantastic. So that was really is a, a responsibility that we're taking on as a whole to make sure that there's, um, you know, no one not included in a conversation, but that everybody's, you know, really feeling a part and feeling welcomed from everyone in Trinity. Thank you. Yeah, just to underline that, um, I can tell you, and this almost happens never, because this congregation is really good at this, but there, the occasional moment when I'm like speaking with someone, and I'm in a conversation, and I'm enjoying the conversation, and I see just kind of a newcomer kind of like walking around by themselves, not knowing what to do, and it's like the most terrifying moment for me in my life in that moment. So if, if you can keep an eye out for the newcomer, because we all know what it's like to not know anyone in a group. And the more that, and, and let me say, this is a strength that I think we have. And just to kind of keep doing that, keep, you know, pausing first before you see the people and talk to the people that you're really good friends with, which is great to do. Pause and look around for the people that you don't know and see if you can reach out to them. That's just something that we can all work on together. All right, now um, the, the part that I kind of have been tasked with, uh, and you see it's like kind of a connection, like how how can we do discipleship? How can we be shaped in such a way that we are then being moved out on mission? And so let me say a couple of things. What is one thing to know for this year? Um, this is something that I'm excited about. You might remember last year I said our goal was for the next year, by this time right now, to have more than half of our congregation in a discipleship group. And I'm pretty confident we're there. We have 12 discipleship groups that over the next few weeks will be up and running, most of them averaging around six people. So that's around 70 people or so in discipleship group. And all of them, I think, are going to be focusing on prayer. And, and I'm really excited about the idea of these groups that are intentionally formed to help each other to grow in Christ. 
I'm really excited to see what fruit is going to be born through that. So, so that's one thing to know, that this is something that's more and more becoming a part of who we are. Um, so what's one step to take as we think not only about how we're shaped, but then how we go outward into serving the world around us on mission? Here's something that we're in the process of figuring out, but I think we're going to be uh, doing in the coming weeks. Um, we're going to invite each community group to take on some sort of way of blessing their community around them. So I'll use Glen Allen's community group kind of as an example because the last couple of years, Glen Allen, through kind of the Spinagle's involvement with World Relief and because World Relief is close to where they were in Glen Allen, they've really kind of gotten very much involved in World Relief. And as a community group, they have served their community together in this really wonderful way. And it's been great for the group, and it's been a way that they've been honoring Christ. And I'd like to invite each community group to think through what, given our context, whether you're in Hinsdale or Western Springs, or maybe you're a group that has a passion for the bridge, what is something that your community group can do this year to bless? And we're even going to, you know, we have a benevolence fund that I always say is for those in our congregation and our community who are in need. And so we'd be excited. The deacons are willing to give like a $500 seed funds to each community group so that you can have a budget to work with as you're trying to think through how do we serve our communities around us. And so I invite you even now to start thinking about how your community group can bless your community. Because I think if each of our community groups are doing that, that's pushing us outward on mission. That is a way that we are seeking fruit together. So one more piece of this that doesn't quite fit with that ministry flywheel because it's something that's kind of outside of this job of us as a congregation growing. But it's something that probably we, that definitely we need to talk about. And, I, and hopefully some of you saw the church newsletter because I kind of went more into detail about that on Friday. But when we're thinking about mission, it, it is a mistake for us only to think about how we as a church can grow. That can get very inward oriented. We also should think that we have the opportunity of sending. That's why we care about Haiti. That's why we care about missionaries. What I want us to also understand is that we should think of Palos as our primary way that we are doing local mission right now. You know, that, that Palos is this congregation in some ways that we have sent. And it is this mission work that is seeing remarkable fruit. I don't know if you have, um, as I said, if you hadn't seen the newsletter, one of the things that it said is Palos is a congregation that is very different from ours. It is different in terms of uh, vocations. You have people who are policemen, truck drivers, teachers. You have an MMA fighter, which I don't think we have any of here in the Hinsdale congregation, although I haven't checked. You have ethnic diversity. You have both a, a large Dutch population and a large Hispanic population. You have much more economic diversity. You have a congregation that we would never be able to reach if we just stayed the way that we are. And so what I want us to know about Palos is that we're in a new phase of seeking to send Palos. More and more we're realizing that this congregation has a different personality and that's necessary to reach a different area. And that our role in Hinsdale is to do what we can to enable them to reach that community. And, and sending, what is sending? Sending means providing spiritual support as we're praying, providing financial support. I mean, as Michael said last week, they have been spending so many hours inviting people, putting door hangers, planting signs. We're praying that this Sunday, even right now, they're seeing more people, but they are full on in mission mode. And our job is to have their backs. So here's one uh, step that I'd like for you to consider taking. For this year, this is a crucial year. This is a year where we are really kind of going in full on mission mode. And so for this year, we want to make sure that they are financially fully provided for. And so I'd like to invite people to do what our family has done in the last few months. Uh, if you are like me and you are doing like an auto debit, that means every month, of course, the same amount is being sent out from your accounts to give to the church. And that's great. It's, it's good for the church. It's good for me because Sunday morning, that's the last thing that I can remember. But the difficulty is that that also auto debit for me becomes autopilot, right? I, I, I don't think about it. I don't reassess and say, oh, God has put us in a different place now than we used to be financially. We can give a different amount. And I'd like to invite for you prayerfully to take some time and also to look, has God put you in a place where you can be giving in a different amount, giving more generously? 
because this is one of the primary ways that we can support Palos in this time that is exciting, but also, and this is the case for any time we're doing mission, is a time of risk, where we don't know exactly what God will do, but we're excited to see. So just to kind of recap, when we have been talking about what this is looking like for us, our goal is to seek to further Christ's kingdom by almost doubling our church size in the next three years. And the key to this is each of us taking steps out of our comfort zones and working persistently and prayerfully together. And, and I want you to notice that I haven't given like a one-size-fits-all for what this looks like. Some of you are really bold inviters, and that is awesome. Some of you are fantastic hosts. And so maybe part of what it looks like for you is you inviting people over to your house and you just being the, you know, like the host for that. Some of you, like me, love to get in a one-on-one conversation and talking with someone who's interested in hearing about the gospel. But if we are working together, each of us with our own gifts, to see God work through us, I'm really excited to see what God will do. A reminder of some of the like, first steps that we've talked about. You know, when you get an email, sign up for daily prayer. Join us for this children's kickoff in a couple weeks. Begin praying for people to invite. Maybe you can think of one household or one person that you should start praying for. Prioritize welcoming the newcomer on Sunday mornings. Consider how will your community group bless your community. And give generously as we seek to send Palos. You know, Brent put this rightly when he said, in some ways what we're seeking to be is back on church plant mode, which I know is probably a bit nerve-wracking for those of us who were at the very beginning of church plant mode and knows that sometimes it demands a decent amount of ourselves. We are in some ways seeking as a small church to plant a mid-sized church. And I know that if only a few of us, the highly committed, whatever that group might be, are doing it, there is no way we can do it. But if all of us are the highly committed and all of us apply the gifts that God has given us and are willing to step out of our comfort zones, whatever that might look like, who knows what God will do? You know, I'm just going to begin, I mean, conclude with the way that we began. I think Carrie has it right. I think we should expect great things from God. And I don't even know exactly what that will be. You know, there's this old, you know, like the Bible says, we propose, but God disposes. This is what we, as we have prayed, believe is the right course for our congregation. But we always will have this plan with an open hand because we know whatever God wants is better than what we want. But I do believe that we should expect great things from God. And I do believe that knowing that we are called to attempt great things for God, even though that's scary. Thank you for your time. Rather than having a Q&A now, what I want to invite is if you have more questions, to talk, you know, you feel free to come up to me after and we can talk, but I don't want to hold people captive if they want to make sure that they have their kids. I really appreciate you giving 45 minutes right now to, to hear this. And I really ask that you pray for all of this, that God would move us forward in a way that honors him. And I want to do that right now.